Howdy folks, and thanks for tuning in to the 11th episode of Rediscover the Winds, a Wyoming history podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Kirsten Belisle. And I'm Zach Larson. Both Kirsten and I work for the Fremont County Museum System located in the heart of West Central Wyoming. Our county museum system has three museums in it, the Riverton Museum, the Dubois Museum, and Wind River Historical Center, and the Fremont County Pioneer Museum. Using artifacts from our three museums and interviews with experts, we're here to discover and in some cases rediscover the quirky, the heart-wrenching, the fascinating stories of Fremont County, Wyoming, and the American West. And this episode marks some first for our podcast show. We're excited to inform our listeners that Rediscover the Winds, a Wyoming history podcast, has put our days of recording in dusty, musty museum attics in the past. We are now coming to you from the Porter's 10-cast studio. That's right. Your favorite local history podcast is now part of your favorite local podcast network. And we have a lot of things that are different. We have microphones and headphones and rainbow colored buttons that I'm really trying to resist to push. But I'll leave the tech stuff to Zach and the other people we're working with here at 10Cast. I think one of them makes a sound, but I'm not actually sure about that. I don't advise pressing all the buttons. Rediscover the Winds also has a brand new sponsor. This episode is brought to you with the support of Mick Pryor, your Edward Jones financial advisor. Look, our money is a lot like Stretch Armstrong. It seems to get pulled in every direction all the time, and most of us manage pretty well. But long-term goals like kids' college and retirement need long-term strategies. Let Mick help you make your financial decisions even better. Call or stop by his office in Riverton anytime and tell him thanks for sponsoring our podcast. All right, so last month we talked about Wyoming's World War II prisoner of war camps and Cheryl O'Brien, a local historian and author of upcoming book, World War II POW Camps of Wyoming, joined the show to provide her expertise and knowledge on the subjects. For this month's episode, we're diving into one of the hottest topics out there, wildfires. Things are definitely heating up in the Wind River Valley as wildfire season settles over most of the western states. Heralded by smoky sign skies and roadside fire danger signs that flash the word extreme at motorists, wildfires are serious business. Oh yes, very serious business. And August marks the anniversaries of several significant wildfires in the region, not to mention it's Smokey Bear's 75th birthday on August 9th. So during this episode, we've decided to take a look at some of the historic wildland fires of Wyoming, their major players, and the scars they left behind, as well as discuss more modern occurrences. To help us tell the stories of wildfires in western Wyoming, we have two guests joining us later on. The first is Carl Brown Eyes of Lander, Wyoming. Uh, Carl was a smoke jumper and a firefighter for for most of his career, and he'll give us a professional take on the topic of of wildfires and forest management and the role that that plays in our states. The second guest joining us today is Johanna Thompson, site manager at the Dubois Museum, a.k.a. my boss. Uh, She's also a Dubois Wyoming native and eyewitness to some of the worst wildfires in Fremont County's history. She's going to share with us a civilian's perspective on wildfires and how they affect an everyday person's life. Carl and Johanna will join us a little later on in the episode um, to share their experiences on wildfires. But for now, let's jump into things with some background info on wildfires in general. Um, Most of us have experience with a fire in the form of campfires, candles, fireworks, and simple things like that that are controlled. Others of us have been unlucky enough to deal with structure fires, wildland fires, um, controlled burns that got out of control, things like that. But fire also has its advantages. Humankind evolved alongside the use of fire. Fire is nature's way of cleaning up natural space and even making it healthier. Fire-adapted areas depend on fire for plant health and wildlife diversity. Sometimes it's hard to see the advantages of fire when all you hear about is destruction and the loss they cause. So the Fremont County Museum System possesses a variety of historic U.S. Forest Service artifacts. And I don't know about the other museums. I honestly don't. I haven't dived into their collections as much. But the Dubois Museum dedicates one of their historic cabins to interpreting the role the Forest Service and other entities play in managing wildfires. So what are some of the more interesting firefighting artifacts that you guys have in your collection? One of my favorite artifacts related to fighting wildfires in the upper Wind River Valley is our old fire cache shed. What is a cache shed exactly? A uh, fire cache shed is its not actually much to look at. It's a small metal shed painted red that sits out behind the museum. I mean, if you weren't looking for it, you'd miss it completely on the property. It's maybe two feet by two feet wide and six or seven feet tall. These sheds, though were installed around Shoshone National Forest and many other forests to store tools and equipment like saws, shovels, axes, 
um, which were used for backcountry firefighting. Before the era of aviation firefighting, small backcountry fire caches like those held in these fire cache sheds played a role in Forest Service fire suppression policy by having equipment ready for use or cached at a prominent location within the trail system of a forest. Our little fire cache shed came from the depths of Shoshone National Forest, far south of the original Sheridan Creek Ranger Station, where Forest Service staff like George Poole or Alfred Clayton and even our local tie hack populations would seek out firefighting equipment to start putting out fires. Um, so wait, the tie hacks helped fight fires? Yeah, so quick response is an important tool in firefighting uh, then and now, and the tie hacks were already working deep within the forest, so they were often the first people to spot fires and to start putting them out. But the tie hacks were not necessarily trained in firefighting and weren't trained professionals, which made an already dangerous job of firefighting even more dangerous when you don't have the proper training. The use of untrained firefighters were still pretty common in the first half of the 20th century. Alfred Clayton, the forest ranger from Dubois, who Kirsten just mentioned, supervised teams of Civilian Conservation Corps members who worked in and around the Bighorn and Wind River basins. Often in the 1930s, CCC teams were dispatched to help fight wildfires. Alfred Clayton himself was a, a unique man, I would say. Born in 1892, Alfred, better known as Al, Clayton served as forest ranger at the Sheridan Creek Station west of Dubois from 1925 to 1936. During his stint in Dubois, he supervised the tie hacking industry, managed stock and range privileges for ranchers, and organized responses to wildfires. And interestingly enough, he was an artist too, and the Dubois Museum has several of his paintings and drawings in its collection. His artwork was often used in United States Forest Service brochures and maps as well. Clayton was, well, mountain-wise and fire-wise, publishing articles in the American Forest Magazine, training Forest Service personnel all over Wyoming and southern Montana. Unfortunately, Al Clayton would only be 45 years old when he lost his life during the infamous Blackwater Fire in August 1937. And while many wildfires of varying, varying proportions, big, little, small, whatever, um, varying damages and locations have cropped up since the Blackwater Fire, one of the most infamous fires in all of Wyoming and probably much of western uh, the United States was the Yellowstone Fire of 1988. Although it wasn't so much a single fire, but rather a conglomeration of 50 or so fires that formed into 11 massive complexes that decimated the park. What began as a series of small fires around and inside the park's borders became a rampaging inferno by July and August 1988. So how long did the fires in Yellowstone burn? Long time. And, and as a result of the federal policy of let it burn, which instructed fire management staff to simply allow natural caused fires to burn themselves out unless they threatened structures or private property, um, they would receive national or massive criticism from national media outlets, state residents, and government officials. Though this policy was suspended by July 22nd, all-out suppression firefighting methods commenced and the fires continued to burn thanks to extremely dry conditions, relentless wind, and difficult terrain. So Saturday, August 20th, 1988 dawned, and with it, the worst single day of fire activity in the summer of 1988. More commonly known by its nickname of Black Saturday, this day saw the fires grow by more than 50%. Firefighters stopped fighting the flames head on and just turned to damage control, holding down structures all over the park with water and various fire retardants, because that's really all they could do in the face of gusting winds up to 50 miles an hour and rugged terrain that makes Yellowstone one of the most beautiful places in the entire country, but it also makes it really hard to fight fires. Yeah. And then another fire started southeast of the Yellowstone Park boundary on Black Saturday. The hellacious winds blew down trees, weakened by months of drought, and one happened to hit a power line and sparked what became the Huck Fire, located on the side of Huckleberry Mountain. The Huck Fire itself grew 4,000 acres in just two hours and would join up with the already existing Mink Fire. Smoke columns were visible from the communities surrounding the parks, including Dubois, and ash fell from the sky as far as 100 miles away. So that would put Lander with ash falling on it. Mm -hmm. and, and in addition, communities like West Yellowstone, Cook City, both in Montana and even Dubois, became meeting grounds for firefighters. Um, their huge supply chains and relief efforts. Firefighters from as far as Hawaii and Florida came to the park that summer trying to help combat the flames. The first U.S. Army infantry troops arrived on August 22nd. These fires would only die down in mid-September when the first rain since the beginning of July fell across the park. With cooler weather and snowfalls, the tide finally turned on the Yellowstone fires. 
but the damage was done. 1.3 million acres in the greater Yellowstone region had burned on a scale so large that many believed it would take 100 years for the forests and wildlife to rebound. Spoiler alert, it did not take 100 years. Nope, it took less than five years for the fire-ravaged meadows and forests to rebound. The new growth far outpaced that of pre-fire years. And in the end, the recovery in Yellowstone was a slam dunk for science and the let-it-burn forest policy in some experts' opinions. The Yellowstone fires were a watershed moment in the public understanding of fire's impact on ecosystems. Wildland fires have become more easily tolerated, except in cases where fires threaten people's houses and structures, an increasing problem as more people move into the urban wild land interface. Earlier this week, um, as, as we mentioned, I talked to Carl Brown as he spent his career in forest and fire management. Uh, we'll listen to a, port- a portion of that interview now. I've heard you're quite the historian on, on just the history of wildfires, and so why don't you take us on that journey through... Yeah, from prehistory to present day and, and how fires have been used. Good, good, yeah. And particularly here in this, uh, what I call the heart of the West, uh, um, this was all contested land. Uh, and so we have to understand that uh, First Nations, as the Canadians would call them, they were, they were First Nations here. And they viewed fire a little differently than uh, we in, in, in our culture. Um, and it's it's kind of good to mix and match and understand how that happens. So years ago, I, I presented a paper at the Plains Indian Seminar, and I and the long long uh, verse of it was, was the tactical and strategic use of fire in the Great Sioux War, which is really it's really fascinating. But if you looked at let's just take a take Sioux and and Northern Cheyenne, if you were get a winner in the Black Hills. Most everyone would, would want a winter there because you got oak to burn, you got pine to burn, mm-hmm. and you've got uh, protection. But you would start out then in a counterclockwise circle moving into the grasslands, up into the Little Bighorn area, and then around into the Bighorns. And then at the end of the, the um, season, you'd end up back at the Black Hills for your winter camp. So that could be a generalization, mm-hmm. but a, a, general, a general movement. Well... What uh, what those Plains Indians uh, were very good at was burning the range, and they did that to invigorate the grasses for the next year. Now, one thing, when I worked with a historian with the National Park Service, we came to this conclusion, putting together his, his research, um, and, and what I knew about fire is that uh, with... Folks, folks in this area understand that we have a general southwest flow of wind. Mm-hmm. And so the fire footprint in this area goes to the northeast. So, if, so you, you start at the uh, start a fire, and it's going to burn basically to the northeast. Now, there's going to be some changes in there. But when I was looking at the maps um, of some of these historic patterns with American Indians, is that... Uh, you were actually burning the range off, but bringing the buffalo with you. By burning the range off and moving in a counterclockwise direction, you were blackening the landscape to the northeast of you and bringing the buffalo with you. So to me, this is conjecture, but I would imagine they were, got very good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the reason we know somewhat about this too are soldiers' journals from the Great Sioux War of 1876 and 77. The uh, Wyoming column came out of Fort Fetterman at Douglas, and they moved north and engaged um, first major battle at the Rosebud. It's just inside the Montana line, uh, just up from Sheridan. After the battle, um, the Sioux and Cheyenne used fire then tactically to slow down the General Crook column. Soldiers could see warriors well-mounted ahead of them, but there was a blackened plain between them. Captain um, Anson Mills was ordered to shoot the played-out horses, and he shot something like 75 Mm. of them in one day because they were starving. And the whole march turned into the Crook Crook Starvation March. Mm. They were finally, um, they, they engaged American horse at Slim Buttes. People from Deadwood saved the column. The point being, so there was this major tactical use of fire. General Nelson Miles took over the campaign in 1877. He took fire role from a tactical standpoint to strategic. And so there's a real difference. Tactical you would use on a specific battle or so. Mm -hmm. But strategic is to 
make the enemy incapable of war. And so he wrote a general order, and he told the troops he wanted all the range burned because he knew from the crook starvation mark what would happen, and he could force, quote, hostiles back on the reservation. Mm -hmm. Now, to do that, he had to develop logistical support. He had to grain feed his horses and so on. What I wanted to make with that in-depth study was that there's basic flaws in how we look at management today. And one of them is the uh, Wilderness Act. In, inside the Wilderness Act, there's a phrase that said, to be managed untram- as areas untrammeled by man. The problem is that's inclusive only to white culture. Yeah. We have to understand that these landscapes were being shaped by indigenous people to their liking, to their benefit beforehand. The practical point of that is that in wilderness areas, we can manage fire, but we have to wait for a natural lightning strike. And oftentimes it's too risky. So you might get the strike in June, and then that leaves you with managing a fire through the entire summer season and into the fall. <clears throat> the point being, looking at cultural fires, we should be able to go into wilderness after Labor Day and start burning because we're looking at uh, the same resource outputs that, say, uh, the Shoshone Indians uh, the Arapaho, the Sioux Cheyenne, we would be looking at habitat for elk, for bighorn sheep, because that was their focus. Mm-hmm. They wanted to, or buffalo if you're out yeah. on the plains. So there needs to be a relook at that act to try to get that more in line with um, the fact that man's been on this planet a long time and has been managed that mm-hmm. resource. Probably the uh, most tragic forest fire in Wyoming history is the Blackwater Fire of 1937. And, and that blew up on August 21st. And I always looked at that week in August as the, as the peak of the fire season mm-hmm. for, for us is that third week in, in August, which is coming up. Yeah. Um, but the fire was actually started on the 18th of August. And uh, like a lot of the fires that hit subalpine fur, a lot of the lightning strikes, it has to do maybe with the moisture or so in a subalpine fur. We'll find so many of these lightning fires hit subalpine fur, and it just slept for a day, hmm. and it um, or two, and it and it finally started kicking up on the twentieth, and then uh, it just got going on the twentieth, and and uh, the uh, the Wapiti CCC company and the forest rangers in the area all responded, and they did it. The they fought it correctly. They anchored at the heel and they flanked it on the twenty first. It it blew up. It had all of the same characteristics of some of the uh, fatality fires like South Canyon or Storm King in Colorado in 94 or, or Man Gulch with the smoke jumpers in 49. In fact, if you look at the topography and you just change it, the slope or aspect, the mountains almost look the same. Mm. Um, but uh, And all of them were, all of those were due to uh, Wind changes uh, could be from a cold front, high wind chain, high winds, and uh, spot fires, and and those things will get you all, all the time. Um, so the, at the end of the Blackwater, we had fifteen fatalities on that fire. Which in the study I had, I presented a paper that um, 1937 Blackwater fire was uh, investigated by um, David Godwin, uh, the assistant director of fire control in Washington. And the traumatic experiences really drive a person to action. And that was the, that was the uh, thesis, so to speak, of my paper. And uh, he then pushed the smoke jumper aerial fire project in 1939. Now, a district ranger back in the 30s in Idaho was the first one that suggested we start dropping smoke chasers by air with parachute. Uh, but everyone says, there ain't no way that's going to happen. And so it, it was just too dangerous. But because of the Blackwater fire in 37, that gave David the incentive to push that. And he had the position power within the agency then to start the, uh, the uh, parachute project at Winthrop, Washington, and then the first fire jump was made in Montana in, in 1940. Uh, Earl Cooley and Rufus Robinson were the first to jump. And uh, 
the savings was huge from the beginning because you were getting guys there to the fire right away. Mm -hmm. um, years ago, I was, I was having, um, we were having dinner at an old rancher, uh, Jared Nesset's place. And Jared told me, uh, and he's just down in uh, South of Lander. He said, you know, Carl, if you really want somebody to remember a story, you got to put it to poem or rhyme. And so if you don't mind, I'll do, it's, mm -hmm. it's fairly quick. Um, and, and this is the difference in how, to, how people make calls and how they see things um, um, develop around them. <clears throat> uh, now, the San Bernardino Forest, that's a, that's a land of unforgiven, at least when it comes to fire. She's hot and ripe for mm -hmm. burning. Now, the Bighorn Crew of Wyoming fame was sent there long ago, the year of 1974, and she burned an orange glow cut through manzanita with hook and brush bars saw to catch a fire growing hot we fought with nature's law but the sector boss was hot to trot and had a lot of gall a saddle stretched below us go down there was his call but our crew boss danny ecker told the sector go pound sand and turn the crew at double time to safety by his hand then fire whirls went from below and raced across the land a blow up she was smoking for the saddle that she ran. Now, I'm glad our boss was Danny, a, a ranger from of old, wood smart and field tested for computers filled the mold. And I'll challenge all technology to match the human mind in a land of unforgiven. I'll take wisdom every time. What resources exist that people can use to learn about Yeah, just to what, what, what fires are going on or what they can do? Yeah, well, um, if you if if you want to stay current with the season on the Boise Interagency Fire Site, if you in, or a specific fire, go to InsaWeb. And um, we were talking earlier about Facebook and uh, why I wasn't a believer in that when you get into incidents because you have to have some quality control. Mm -hmm. um, so InsaWeb is the best if it's a specific fire, and that was developed too for families because um, if you're off on a fire, they always want to hear what how their, their son, daughter, husband, or whoever, father is doing. And so InsaWeb will help there. Um, that's, a, that's a key venue. Um, and then the um, just the general information um, where we are. We're probably at a preparedness level two or three right now. We go to five. Um, that's when resources are being are exhausted. Mm -hmm. um, so we haven't really hit a really hot fire season this year, but uh, – um, that's all in the whole incident information system that's out there. Uh, Boise Interagency Fire Center will cover all of that. Um, I think locally, though, at the county and state forestry, FireWise is key. And so if you have a – and maybe I'll point out some problems that I've seen in that urban interface, and that's where homes are moving out into the uh, to the wild wildlands. Um FireWise is the best place to go if you want to be proactive. Mm -hmm. And and we've looked at this, and I've known people that have studied this. And even if those that advice is free, a lot of people won't, won't even take part of it um, to have an assessment even done on their home if it's in a ur wildland urban interface. And it's, it's more easy to maybe rebuild or it's, it's almost dumbfounding the people that don't, won't use it. Uh, but firewise is is key. Uh, I think the the problem we had in the Forest Service was that it's also the turnover. So if you had a uh, uh, private home development next to the national forest, part of the problem was would be a turnover. And I could use maybe Warm Springs up at Dubois as an example. After you've had some fire, you may have some long term residents up there. And I always say, you guys are the key because you've lived through this and you you're the ones that can better tell these new neighbors because people cycle through that. And so, so, um, right when you think the public in that area is up to snuff on how to protect their home and all with new people moving in, there's just this huge turnover yeah. and these, and, and the majority of these people are not used to rural living. So that was just a, a short, summary of, of the interview that I did with Carl Brown eyes. The full interview was an extremely interesting and informative hour 
And uh, we'll be releasing that as a bonus episode sometime soon. So the conversation with Carl Brown is, like we said, um, definitely gives a professional view, a person who is involved in the fighting of fires. Um, and it gives us that kind of a perspective to look at and hear and just kind of explore. So we've heard from the, the professional side of wildfire management. Here to help illustrate how the 2016 Lava Mountain Fire showed the importance of communities coming together in the face of these natural disasters is Johanna Thompson. Okay, so I, my name is Johanna Thompson, and I grew up in Dubois, and I um, went to school here. I left for about 10 years after high school, and then I decided I really missed the area, the mountains, the wildlife, the people, so I moved back in 2006. You actually have a significant role in the Lava Mountain Fire um, events, so if you wanted to tell us about your experiences with that, that would be excellent. Okay, so I was actually driving home from work at the museum one evening, and um, I saw a tiny puff of smoke on like the southeast side of Lava Mountain, and I thought, what is that? And so I sat there a minute and watched, and I thought, there isn't a road there, thinking that maybe it was dust from a vehicle driving down a dirt road. I thought, no, that can't be. So I took a picture of it because I thought no one would follow up on it or believe me because it was such a little sporadic thing. So I continued home, called 911, and reported it. Then I went out to the highway, and I met with Mike Frankini and I think A.J. Albright at our highway driveway. And I showed them the pictures, and then we waited a few minutes, and then it puffed off. And so they headed out to find it. Um, the Forest Service fire crews spent the next week, I think it was roughly a week, trying to find the fire. It would pop up, puff up every day, but they couldn't physically find it through all of the thick debris and everything else. So meanwhile, though, the foliage on the ground was getting drier because it, we were into the hot summer days by then. And on the afternoon of Museum Day, mm -hmm. it actually um, decided to take off and go and turn into a fire. And it didn't stop until it arrived at the Union Pass subdivision. Um, so the fire that we feared would happen was happening at this point. Um, there's nothing like watching the fire come to you and you can do nothing to stop it. Um, and this was actually the third time that we were pending evacuation. And so by the time that this happened, we were just done. All of us were over it. Let's just get this over with. So we, we packed up some things, but not very much really and um, ended up evacuating and staying in a small camper for about three weeks. Um, we were very tired of the confined space, though. And uh, we couldn't. We probably could have gone back a little bit earlier, but we couldn't because the air was so bad at night that you just couldn't breathe. It would suffocate you. During the day, it was beautiful, but at night, it was horrible. That's understandable. So what... Did you decide to pack up? I mean, facing a wall of fire coming to your property where your family's lived for decades, like what do you choose to bring? Me being a Wyoming girl, the first thing to go was firearms. <laughs> <laughs> guns, got to get the guns out. <laughs> and then um, after the guns, it was like family things, you know, family pictures, papers, documents, stuff like that that you couldn't replace. Mm -hmm. Um and I think, you know, we just took clothes that we needed for a little while. We actually ended up going back in later to go back and get more clothes because we're like, okay, everything's fine-ish, you know, and we're out of clothes. <laughs> so probably should have taken more clothes. Um, but we left, like, just stuff behind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. What did you do with your animals? I know you had animals on the ranch. Yeah, so we, um, actually our horses were the first things that we hauled out as soon as we saw after the museum day episode. Um, we're like, okay, there's no, this thing is not stopping. So we ended up hauling those out. Um, they actually went to the box hanging three for a little while and then they went out to Kay and Jerry Weber's place. Kay, um, works at the museum too. And so they went out there. I think they were gone probably a month, month and a half from the ranch um and then we had our dogs with us and our cats 
I think our chat must have gone to Carolyn Copeland, I think, for the time being. I don't remember exactly. She didn't say home, though. How did your experience with the Lava Mountain Fire differ from the other wildfires in the area? Was there a difference? Was it just part of life? or? Um, no, for, for us and the people, I imagine everybody feels like this, that was evacuated and was part of this fire. Um, it was different from the others that we've had because it it li- literally burned right up to some houses. Um, and for us, it burned our back fence. There was actually slurry dropped out of airplane. I think they did three drops at our house to try to save it. Um, there was helicopters that were dumping water all day trying to save our place too. And so I guess the difference was that this one was the one that would have burned us up. Mm. Um, whereas the other ones had been close, you know, and they kind of came that way, but they got stopped a little ways away. Um, and there's been other fires like at Porsche Creek that have been close to T Cross and some other places, you know, and so just depending on where the fire is, I guess, is how it's going to affect you. But, um, certainly the closer it is, the more scary it is. So can you tell us about your experience or the community's experience during the 2006 Purdy fire? Yeah, so um, I have a very special bond with the Purdy Fire. <laughs> um, we, When it started, we actually saw it burning for about a month before it became an issue. And it just kept growing a little bit every day and moving a little closer towards our home. Um, my wedding was actually on a Saturday, August 19th. And the Monday before our wedding, the Forest Service came to visit us first thing in the morning and told us... Um, they brought a bunch of maps, too, and laid them out on a table, showed us what it burned and where it was going. And I think it burned about three and a half miles that night. And we were within three miles of the fire at that point. And they told us to start packing our things and thinking about leaving because we would have to leave in a moment's notice because it was burning straight for us. Um, my mom freaked out. <laughs> She's like, no way. We have a wedding here this weekend. We can't, we can't leave. We have a wedding. You tell that fire and to they're like, well, plans. Yeah, exactly. They're like, well, sorry, the fire's coming. So you better think of a back, backup plan, you know, for the wedding. <laughs> so that's what we had a backup plan in town. And so at that point, we kind of divided forces. And my mom took over planning for the wedding and dealing with food. She's like, either way, we have people coming, so we got to have food for these people to eat. We have to we have to do a wedding no matter what. I was heading up the evacuation group that was like, I don't care where the wedding is. It can be anywhere. I'm saving my stuff. Mm-hmm. So anyways, we kind of divided forces. And um, the Friday evening before the wedding, the Forest Service came and told us that they think that you know, everything's going to be fine. Go ahead with the wedding. So we did. Um, that morning, the four service crews were at the place um, setting up structure protection around all of the houses. And then, uh, so I actually have a picture with my hair all nicely done and ready to go to the wedding with the firefighters. <laughs> and then, um, then we, so we proceeded with the wedding. Everything was beautiful. And then about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, um, the fire kicked up and we started getting hot embers falling down. And uh, we had a big old canopy tent set up. And so needless to say, we tore that down in a hurry so that it didn't burn. And um, the party kind of ended quickly, but that's okay. So that gave us time to clean up. And then uh, we actually had Tim Hayes cooked a pig for us. He smoked a pig in a smoker mm-hmm. up at the house. And um, so we cleaned that up. And that night a grizzly bear came through and um, tried to get the pig, and he never got in the smoker, but it's all scratched and still has the scratches today. So we laugh about how the grizzly bear wanted the pig. And then, um, so after everything was said and done and people left, we had a whole bunch of pig left over and cake left over because the party just kind of fizzled. Mm-hmm. So we fed the firefighters lunch for about a week. Wow, well, that is a good and, uh, pig. We started moving on to hot dogs and hamburgers and <laughs> whatever else. And so it was kind of funny because our place ended up being the like the meeting point for the fire crews during the day. Mm-hmm. But um, it was so nice. And the fire did actually end up getting, I think, within about a mile of the ranch by the time that it stopped and snow just put it out. Well, that was very convenient. And I'm sure yeah. lots of firefighters were 
happy to get a good meal. Your mom is an excellent cook. Well, thank you very much, Johanna. We really appreciate you agreeing to come on our podcast and doing an interview with us. And thank you very much for sharing your stories. Like I said, that was Johanna Thompson, current site manager of the Dubois Museum and witness to some of the worst and closest proximity fires to the little town of Dubois. There are a lot of grass fires that happen around uh, River Tinted Lander, some controlled burns that get uncontrolled, uh, or just, you know, somebody parked on the side of the road, and unfortunately the sparks from a truck or a hot piece of metal will catch the dry, dry grass on fire. So we just ask that, you know, Think about what you're doing when you come out here. It's not like the Midwest where everything is still green, um, which is where I'm from. So I've never dealt with wildfires on the scale that some people from Wyoming and California and places like that have dealt with. Well, we'd like to thank both Carl and Johanna for meeting with us and and doing interviews and being on our podcast. Uh, We also thank you, our listeners, for sticking with us through this 11th episode of Rediscover the Winds, a Wyoming history podcast, and our first episode as part of County 10's 10Cast podcast network. That was a lot of cast and Casts podcast. and pods and P's and C's. But it's super exciting. New yeah. things are happening with Rediscover the Winds, and we very much appreciate the opportunity to get out of our musty, dusty museum attics. We're very fond of them, but at the same time, we would like to branch out sometimes Uh, we have several more podcast episodes planned for you guys next month we celebrate the 66th anniversary of the discovery of uranium in fremont county and it's also back to school season as an adult i don't have to deal with that anymore and it's wonderful but we know a lot of people have kids and friends and relatives that are heading back to school soon so we'll actually be exploring what life and particularly what school was like in the small uranium villages in the gas hills around riverton uh so if you like what you heard today uh like us on facebook at rediscover the winds a wyoming history podcast we share tons of pictures of the people places and things we talk about in episodes And we give you guys sneak peeks into future episodes. We also have a YouTube page, a Stitcher account, iTunes account, and we are now hosted on County 10's podcast page. So if you've already followed us on our various platforms, thank you. Your support means the world to us, and we hope you guys get the chance sometime, someday, if you haven't already, to visit our museums or attend some of our upcoming museum events. And we've got a ton of events coming up. Summer is still going strong in the Wind River region, so Mm -hmm. there's a lot of things for visitors and residents to do in our museum system. As part of our Bailey Tire and Auto Services and Pit Stop Travel Centers sponsored children's exploration series, we have at the Pioneer Museum on August 24th from 1 to 3 p.m. a children's ledger art. Um, Ledger art is super cool. If you have never heard of ledger art before, hit pause and Google it. It's just, it's really, really unique and interesting, uh, a form of art um, in the, in the, the late, I guess, 1800s and early 1900s as, as, European and Native American culture began to mix. Um, So you can learn about that history and create your own pages in this children's exploration program. Like I said, it was on August 24th from 1 to 3 p.m. And that's at the Pioneer Museum is in Lander. The cost is $4 per person, and we do require advanced registration because space is limited. So after you're done Googling it, call the Pioneer Museum and reserve your spot. The Wyoming Community Bank sponsors some of our Discovery Speaker Series, and they are all free and open to the public. So at the Pioneer Museum, again, we have a Historic Wagons Speaker Series. The Pioneer Museum will host Al Salmon's Wagon Rebuilder for this Wyoming Community Bank Discovery Speaker Series on September 7th at 7 p.m. Mr. Salmon's will walk and talk about the history of the wagon with close examinations of the wagons in the Pioneer Museum's collections. We also have lots of adventure treks still left to do for the summer and fall season. The Wind River Visitors Council sponsors the following adventure treks. The Pioneer Museum has the historic Ed Young Apple Farm Trek on August 17th at 1 p.m. This trek is going to explore one of the largest and oldest orchards in the valley. Ed Young got Lander designated as the Apple City and is one of the true pioneers in the Lander Valley. Participants will meet at the Pioneer Museum and take a bus to the ranch. It's $8 per person and advanced registration is required as space is limited. Call the Pioneer Museum to reserve your spot. And then the Dubois Museum has our annual Mystery Sheep Trap Trek coming up on August 20th. So the Dubois Museum and the National Bighorn Sheep Center will bring visitors on an educational hike to one of the many areas sheep traps. 
participants will learn about the Mount Shoshone, who built and used these traps, as well as why the traps worked and other key facts about bighorn sheep. Steep climbs and gorgeous scenery are guaranteed. It's $8 per person, and advanced registration is required, so call the museum to reserve your spot. Finally, on August 24th at the Riverton Museum, we're hosting uh, an adventure trek to just go explore downtown Riverton. We're meeting at 9 o'clock in the morning, again on August 24th. We'll just look at uh, historic downtown Riverton and some of its buildings, and we'll just get to learn the, the unique and interesting history of, of our wonderful little Riverton. Um, so call the Riverton Museum to re- reserve your spot. Um, or take your chances and show up in the morning of, and we will likely have space for a few more. So um, that's it. Those are all of our upcoming events. And again, we thank Carl and Johanna for sharing their knowledge and experiences with us. And thanks for listening to this Wyoming history podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Kirsten from the Dubois Museum and Wind River Historical Center. And I'm Zach from the Riverton Museum. We look forward to continuing this adventure to rediscover the winds with you next time. The intro and outro music to this episode is from the 1976 Wyoming Old Time Fiddle Competition held in Shoshone.